So this is a project that's uh, a lot uh, younger than some of the ones you've seen. I, I, I neither have 140 collaborators in 87 countries, nor do I have uh, 100 million euros a year for 10 years, but I'm hoping to have both of those very soon. Um, so the, the, the basic problem is one of, of model validation. So um, verifying that your model does what it says it does in a, in a, in a, just a, on a software level, that uh, each time you do the simulation, you get the same trace. That's, that's one question that, that we have a, 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 a better handle on and have had a better handle on for, for long, a while. But um, what we really want to start doing is making sure their models are, are valid in the scientific sense, that they match uh, experimental data. So specifically what we mean is um, a, a model, we want to be able to have both in-sample and out-of-sample validity. We want to be able to have models that are consistent with data that we already know about. Uh, and then we want to have models that predict uh, the res uh, future experiments. And um, this is something that I think is, we all, of course, want to do when we build our models, but um, actually formally doing this uh, in, a, in a sort of rigorous way is something that really hasn't been possible and, and still is only barely possible, but it's, it's becoming more possible with the development of, of, of related tools. So in order to test uh, validity, um, here's an example of a, of a model, uh, the model trace uh, and, uh, and some data uh, from a model uh, that I worked on about nine years ago. And, um, you know, do you guys think that the, that the, that the simulation matches the data? I mean, I, I probably thought that when I, when I published it and the reviewers were okay with it, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, there is, and the problem is that, that this is a really uh, informal claim about whether or not the model was valid um, and that uh, it's difficult to actually formally evaluate it. I don't even know how I would go and track that down and, and figure it out now. Um, it, and it's, it's difficult to even find out what are the claims uh, in, a, in a model across, uh, across papers and across the literature. Um, and also, uh, it's claims that are, are very broad, that give models scope, that they, that they are uh, claiming to be valid across a wide range of data are, are rare because usually uh, the data that a, a modeler has access to is something that they collected or that their collaborator collected and that's sort of the focus of their model. Um, so, this is becoming a real problem because there's uh, lots and lots of data that we have to account for, uh, and um, the, the you know, rate of, of growth of the number of papers we have has been growing exponentially for 100 years, um, and PubMed, if I had it on that, would be somewhere up in the upper right corner, um, and as Sri Joy uh, said before. And so um, it's just going to be really hard to informally validate models. You can't track down all this data by hand. You can't write some sort of a, a test to make sure your model is valid uh, on a manually and, and in any you know, reasonable amount of time. So how are we going to actually achieve testing? Well, um, if, you know, if we don't figure this problem out, then, you know, and we haven't, then it's, it, I think uh, modelers will not know uh, whether um, what they're doing has, uh, you know, the phenomenon they're trying to model has already been explained by, by some other model, um, and what aspects of the phenomenon, what data sets need to be explained. And really we need a framework for doing this in, in a formal way, and, and uh, software engineering has already has a framework that we can borrow uh, called unit testing. So what is unit test? Um, just from, from Wikipedia, a unit testing is something you use to make sure a piece of code is, is that it works, uh, uh, that's fit for use. Um, you try to make it as small as possible to test only one aspect of, of the code of the code base. Um, and it's really a, sort of a strict and formal way of ensuring that if something passes a unit test, that it really does um, what, you, what you say it does, or, which is encoded in the test itself. So what does that mean for science? Well, a scientific model, some kinds of scientific models, uh, can be viewed as, as functions that take some sort of observation as input to, to parameterize the model and try to produce some predictions. So it's just like a function in, in, in software. And the observations you know, would hopefully include some sort of metadata to direct the model, because uh, if I tell you that uh, the firing rate was 20 hertz uh, and you're a modeler, I mean, what, what, when, when is it 20 hertz? So what was the conditions under which it was 20 hertz? You have to know something about that. Um, so, as just an example, if you had a complete model of some cell type, uh, physiologically, um, you'd really want it to replicate things that are observed experimentally, like um, spike shapes and rates in, in interspike interval distributions. So, uh, scientific unit tests, uh, you want to try to encode each of the kinds of features above in a, in a single test, and then have a suite of tests that you can use to, to test your model. So, that's what Psi unit is all about. Uh, it's um, that, you know, we can't just Sort of, sort of show an informal match to, to data in a journal articles, it's not going to work. 
Um, and, um, but if we can build these uh, unit tests collaboratively, then we can uh, continuously test models and characterize the validity of the model according to the set of tests that they can pass or how well they, they do on those tests. So that's a project uh, we're working on now. So uh, visualizing that, I mean, what would that look like ultimately when you're, when you're looking at models and data? Well, you might have a lot of different, uh, uh, this is just an example from another field, right? From, from solar dynamics. Uh, and so you have different uh, models that try to predict something about what's going on in solar cycles. Maybe it's, you know, luminance or sunspot number or something. Uh, and then you have different tests corresponding, in this case, to different solar cycles. Uh, you have some, some measure of goodness of fit, which is like the output of a, of a test. And you can also summarize that, you know, with a, some sort of test suite that, that averages or aggregates the test somehow and reports and look at a final value and you say, okay, I think I know which, which model I want to use. It, it accounts for the data that matters to me. Um, so what are the challenges? I mean, this is really hard uh, because um, there's a very wide range of model scales and languages uh, and, and, and goals of models. Um, and development time is something that, you know, you don't want to have to sit down and write this big uh, suite of unit tests. Every time you make a model, you, you spend, you know, years doing that. Uh, and uh, how do you really know whether the test that you're looking at is, uh, or that you're writing, is a fair test? What if someone disagrees with you and they say, no, I think we should really be testing it this way? Um, so we have three, uh, three basic approaches. One is you know, unit testing philosophy, uh, having domain standards, and having collaborative development, I think, can solve, can solve all of these. Um, and so first, uh, you know, what does this mean uh, here? I am not going to go into the details of implementation of one of the key features in, in SciUnit, which is about uh, examining and, and determining model capabilities, uh, but the, I've written a small play that will help, will help illustrate the, the issue. So um, if a test essentially should be able to say to a model, this is what I need you to do in order for you to take this test. If you don't have these features, uh, you won't be able to take this test. And then that's just uh, sort of not applicable. Um, and what you have to do is be able to formalize what those features are and figure out how if and uh, models have them and then the leave it to the model to, to implement those capabilities. So one model says, okay, I can't actually do this thing, so I won't be tested. Another model says, I can do all these things, and then the test can be executed. So it's, it, you know, behind the scenes, there's a lot of code that does this, but uh, that's the basic idea. Um, how do we solve uh, the development time? How, how do we make this fast? Well, um, there are some emerging standard data sources that people can use to parameterize tests instead of just sort of uh, looking in a paper and writing down the values or scraping CSV files or something. Um, and Neuroelectro is one of those, and you just saw Shudra uh, presented. So uh, here's the one example of code I'm going to show, but essentially uh, generating uh, a test based on data from Neuroelectro is, is really easy. You basically provide the name of a neuron and the name of a property, and uh, our option with some metadata, which I'm not including here, um, and you can uh, sort of find out some other information from Neuroelectro about what, where that data is coming from and, and uh, other information you might want to know, and then essentially uh, creating a test uh, that's parameterized by that, by that observation, and then it would contest models against that observation. Uh, so uh, uh, it uses the Neuroelectro API, and, and these you know, neuron names is defined by Neuroelect. And so collaborative development. Well, if, if you have a test and, uh, and someone doesn't like the test, you can always fork it. So um, if uh, uh, you think someone should have used you know, a z-score and instead they used uh, uh, you know, a difference in means, then um, you can uh, fork the test and you can make that revision. There can be discussion about it, issues. Uh, maybe hopefully you can one day reemerge and, and save the future. Um, so you can always fork it. Um, so you can use this sort of uh, approach to have competitions between models. Uh, so one example of a competition that's actually been done before, the quantitative single neuron modeling competition, uh, this was something that happened a few years in a row in the latter part of the last decade, uh, and, and eventually was hosted by INCF. Um, it was a, a battle between uh, reduced models of neurons, um, and uh, there was a reference data set that was used uh, to see if these models could predict spike times and with what accuracy and uh, which models did better on which data. And this is uh, done uh, in, in a slightly more informal fashion, but it's the closest thing to comparison of models across data sets that I think we've had in, in, in electrophysiology. And I'm rebooting this uh, with SciUnit, and it's actually on um, the INCF website now, and it's in, in development. But the goal of redoing this is that people are always making new models, people are always releasing new data sets, so to have, say, one paper that compares them frozen in time forever, uh, this should be a living competition, and, and you can constantly see what is the state of the art in reduced neural models, for example. 
Um, so there's, you can also have competitions between algorithms or techniques because essentially they're, they're just models of, uh, that take the raw data and, and give you some information that's assumed to be you know, uh, in, in that data, like spike times, for example, or uh, if it was calcium imaging, or spike assignments, if it was spike sorting. And you can run competitions like that. And there are, as long as there's a ground truth data set available, you can really can run a test. So what are the active use cases that we're working on? I mean, sort of three scales. Uh, one is I showed you the quantitative single neural modeling competition, which is uh, reduced models of neurons. Uh, another is with open source brain. So there's, um, Porik talked about that. And there are biophysically detailed neuron models uh, that are um, significantly uh, more uh, complex than the reduced models. Um, it, it's, it's on one platform, but there are models that span many different uh, cell types. And uh, right now, I can, uh, uh, because the standards Open Source Brain uses, uh, I can test about a dozen models uh, across among some of the 26 uh, electrical properties that, that are neuroelectro, uh, and write validation tests for those. And then you can ask, OK, uh, which of these uh, granule cell models uh, best reproduces spike widths observed in, in granule cells under these conditions, and so forth. Um, and then open worm, uh, there's you know, definitely validation tests to do. So you have the worm moving, and you want to know if the worm moves in a way that matches uh, the, the experimental or the, the, the real worm. And uh, you, can, you can drive, you can uh, create tests and, and test that model. Um, so th the reason this is so hard is that there's a lot of pieces to going from getting data and models and testing them. And these are really all, uh, pretty much all the steps. Uh, and each of these uh, basically have to be uh, connected together. Um, and if everyone's using different implementations of each of these steps, uh, it's an impossible problem. And that's why I think this is impossible uh, five years ago even. Um, but now, as we've converged towards domain standards, um, you, there's, the code development time has been reduced substantially. Uh, um, so here's some examples of domain standards. This is not to mean it's an exclusive list. So in some cases, there's multiple standards. Some of these projects get varying levels of maturity. But if you can, uh, if you can link uh, these together, um, then uh, you can have a pipeline for model testing that relies upon those standards, and anything that's compliant with those standards or can be converted into those standards uh, can be tested. And um, so that's, that's the basic goal of a project called Neuron Unit. So for a particular domain, uh, you want to have a way of linking those standards together. And for single neuron electrophysiology, uh, I personally have enough understanding, of, I think, of the standards to know what they are and how um, I can link them together. Uh, and uh, so that's what ne the Neuron Unit Project is all about. And um, so what are the benefits of, of all of this? I mean, it's, um, to be able to test your models, I shouldn't have to sell that too much. But um, you want to know what models Previous models can and can't do, so you have a, a path forward in knowing what your model needs to do. It'd be nice to be able to do a continuous validation of your model during development rather than just creating the model and finding out if it's any good uh, when you get ready for publication. Um, so it accelerates model development. Uh, you want to have the best model, so it's a way of, 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 of proving against at least some test. Uh, and address uh, the many reviewers who demand that your model pass these tests. And, uh, and even post-publication review of your model. It shouldn't be frozen in time. It should be on open source brain, and you should be able to continuously test as new data comes out and see if this is still a good model or if it needs some revision. Um, and many other benefits as well. Um, so, uh, and as an experimentalist or a tester, what is it that you want, uh, you want to do? Uh, you, you want people to put your observations in context. When you observe something, um, you don't know if there's a model that, that would have predicted this. Uh, and if there is, uh, you should probably look at it. And if, it, if there isn't, then you might want to build it. Um, so, uh, uh, and what other data does that model explain? It can give you an idea for future experiments that you want to do. Um, here's an, an idea, you know, when you, when you write a grant, you might say, I want to do experiment X, and uh, if it turns out this way, that proves this, if it turns out this way, that proves that. And you can actually do that before you write the grant by uh, uh, writing a test for that observation and using hypothetical data, and then running against models that already exist. And then you can say in your grant, yeah, if I get this, it really will demonstrate Formally, that model X is more correct than model Y. Um, and I think that's something that you know, people want to have those experiment results in context, that no matter what experiment you get, there is some implication. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, increased awareness of the data set you collect. Your data set could become the gold standard. And you know, I think we all know, in some domains, data sets that are a gold standard for, for a model or for, for, for uh, uh, just reference to what it is that this thing, uh, this phenomenon is in a particular say, cell. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, my main uh, collaborator, Cyrus, uh, who's a software engineer who's uh, figured out a lot of the hard problems of, of putting things together. Uh, Shrijoy, uh, Neuroelectro, Sharon uh, at Arizona State, and, and Porig with Open Source Brain. And thank you for the organizers for inviting me.
questions? So maybe I can start then. Um, the, uh, so how do you decide on uh, your sort of single cell model as what, to what is a good test to start? I mean, you can do some very basic tests. So, so in, 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 in the abstract, uh, I think most physiologists have uh, s s agreement about the kinds of things that they might like to test. As far as which particular data sets they like to test and what constitutes passing the test, those are entirely subjective. Um, so, uh, uh, but to simply just lay it out and say, you know, here, here are the data sets. I, I personally, with my domain knowledge in that field, uh, will you know, get the ball rolling by, by starting tests. For example, d uh, data collected from NeuroElectro. Um, but there are other options for tests. Um, uh, electrophysiology properties is something that there's, there's, until recently and still now, not really a good ontology for electrophysiological properties. But you know, we, can, we can still list things, like input resistance and spike width and spike height and things like that. Good, good models uh, that work really well for a very tiny part of parameter space. Yes. Therefore, you need to work with the person who is going to develop the model to make sure that the, the tests um, yes. So, so, uh, so, you know, obviously, you can you can sweep parameter space to find the the, the set of parameters that will pass a given test. Uh, hopefully, uh, you don't have to sweep it independently for every test, uh, or you're probably not. It's not very robust, right? But uh, you, uh, for something like. Uh, uh, if someone has, has published a model, uh, they, they will make the claim sometimes that this model reproduces a, a system. And it turns out when you look into the details, sometimes they have actually varied the parameters at every stage for every figure they make. Um, and uh, that's something that you, you have to deal with. But a model, in SciUnit, a model is, is, is a class that is not parameterized. You, pr you instantiate it by parameterizing it with a particular set of, 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 uh, of let's say, model parameters, uh, and then you, 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 when you execute the test, uh, runtime arguments like how much current did you inject, for example. That's, uh, so that's, that's what the layers of, of going from general to specific uh, for models. Okay. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much.